The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. Thanks, Kai. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, present this right here in uh, my backyard and uh, right here in Michigan. I'm going to just kind of go through a couple of slides here to kind of introduce the, the technology that uh, we have that has been used in this project. Uh, this is called the Pemsmore Estate. It's in Missouri. You know, our company makes a steel fiber. Uh, that uh, actually under license from the University of Michigan. So I came out of that program. The product was developed there. We secured a license. And it's really been kind of interesting to see. We've been in business for now around 15 years. Uh, there's been a lot of research initially on the UHPC applications of the product, the twisted steel micro rebar, we'll call it here. Uh, it's a twisted steel fiber. The company itself, as I'll show you, has done a lot of just traditional steel fiber type uh, applications, but we're starting to get to the point where we're, we're having customers come to us and ask about UHPC applications. So this is, uh, you know, we'll come back to this, but this is actually a 65,000 square foot residence in Christian County, Missouri. Uh, it's designed for sort of a worst case scenario. Uh, it, the design condition was actually a, a 300 mile per hour wind load assuming, almost assuming that a tornado would directly hit the building. This isn't too far from Joplin. So, you know, obviously the owner, you know, is concerned about that, perhaps other, other conditions uh, beyond wind. So just a little history of the twisted steel, and I'll pass a, a sample around here in a minute. The, the twisted steel micro rebar you might have heard of before as uh, referred to, at least in the academic community, as Torex. It's a twisted, it's a polygonal twisted shaped steel fiber. We don't really call it steel fiber, we call it twisted steel micro rebar, but in essence uh, it's, a, it's a rectangular shape that's twisted about its own axis. Uh, it was developed at the University of Michigan. We licensed it in 2003. There was continued research at the University of Michigan and actually Kai was in, in, involved with some of that into the UHPC applications. The, the, the main advantage, as I'll show you, is really the enhanced bond that the twist provides. Uh, since then, there's been more research, uh, you know, over in UAE on UHP applications, and I'm going to focus most of the presentation here on the, uh, the the cladding application specifically. So, so that's kind of where we get to. So this is just kind of basic material properties of this this product. Uh, because of the twisted shape, it really um, uh, it does two things. It enhances the bond to the concrete initially, and I'll show you some uh, pictures that kind of show that. But it was actually also designed to provide sort of optimized post-crack behavior by changing the failure mechanism from sort of a hook straightening or a frictional mode to an actual untwisting mode. So this is actually a picture that comes way back from the University of Michigan of a piece of this twisted steel micro rebar being pulled through a piece of concrete. And you can see it actually has to untwist as it comes out. So as a result, you can develop these uh, pullout curves that provide very stable tension resistance regardless of the strain. And the consequence that nobody really realized initially at the university is that the bond is so good because of that twisted shape. You know, it's a very simple concept. Twist uh, the, the um, sort of a screw versus a nail concept. That we're actually able to pick up load before the development of dominant cracks. And that shows up in modulus or rupture testing, even at very low dosages. So even putting 10 pounds per cubic yard, 20 pounds, 50 pounds per cubic yard, well below sort of the 1%, 2% volume fractions that we're used to seeing in UHPC, uh, we're getting an increase in modulus or rupture. So uh, that has a lot of applications in uh, pavements and things like that that are designed based on plain concrete uh, properties. The other thing that I'm very proud to talk about is that we are an American-made product. It's made right here in Michigan. You know, uh, we have three products. 
the 513 is, is it may be a product that uh, it's a newer product. It may be of interest to any of you who are studying UHPC because I know a lot of the research is on short uh, fibers. That product is available. The what I call the the, the, the workhorse or the one that's been a, around for a long time is the Helix 525. That's a 25 millimeter piece. That's what the, that's what's being passed around. And then the the 852 is a two inch long piece that is really for uh, you know, we have a tunnel project under New York City, for example. So it's tunnel linings and things like that. So this is just kind of a sample of the applications. The company is really focused on sort of all the other applications. So, you know, uh, vertical applications, slabs. We have been able to go into the vertical applications more successfully than uh, others because we've done a lot of work in characterizing the behavior of the product in indirect tension uh, using uh, tension specimens like this and uh, developing, we actually have developed an evaluation report that allows the product to be used for certain applications, again, under certain restrictions and vertical applications, slabs, foundations, things like that. Uh, if you look at the test results in more uh, traditional tests, this is your EN 14655 because, or 651, because of that twist, that untwisting failure mechanism, we're able to achieve very good post-crack behavior, even at lower dosages. This is 25 kil kilograms of the, that, that longer product versus a 80-60 uh, hook-ended fiber. So we're able to get quite a bit uh, enhanced performance post-crack as well as a boost initially. You can see that curve goes up higher initially in those, in those, uh, those, those types of specimens. As far as UHPC properties, uh, they have been evaluated. You've got to be a little careful because the Torex product that it was at the university was a 0.3 millimeter, very high tensile, high aspect ratio pro product, not, he not what we call Helix or the 525 product that was passed around. This research was done at the University of uh, UAE, and this was on the Helix, the, the 525 product. Uh, they characterized behavior in these different mix designs here, uh, ranging from... Uh, 88 to about 110 MPA, and looked at you know not just uh, you know the the basic properties. You'll see an increase, of course, in splitting tensile and uh, compressive strength as the con as the as the dosage increases. But they did a lot of uh, microscopic analysis where they established, and it's a little hard to see in this picture, but they established that in fact they were seeing uh, quite quite a bit of micro cracking occurring in the in the interface region between the twisted steel. Uh, fiber and the concrete, which is sort of explains why we're seeing some of the behavior that we see, you know, the increase in modulus of rupture and things like that. So what we're going to talk about, uh, sort of with that history in mind, is this, this going back to this Pemsmore project, this, this cladding design. So the owner came to us, they had actually used the product in the building itself, in the walls and the slabs and all that, uh, and they wanted to provide a cladding that was uh, architecturally interesting, but also uh, could handle the wind loads that were involved, uh, as well as uh, you know, potentially uh, some kind of a, maybe a blast effect. You know, the, again, the building's really being designed uh, really under sort of the worst case scenario uh, FEMA type standards. So I'm gonna pass this around. Um, one of these pieces here, this one in particular, just be careful with it, it's a little heavy. This is an actual piece of the cladding that you see here. You can see it's not that big and it's got a tonguey groove system on the end. And uh, uh, earlier there's a presentation on connections. One of the unique things about this is it doesn't rely on single anchor points for connections. It, it, it actually fits into a, a rail system that then is anchored into the building. So there's no single point stress concentrations um, as this thing is attached. And these are relatively small panels, so they're they're one foot by two, three foot lengths, and they're designed to look like uh, stone. So uh, just be careful with um, you know the weight of that. And the other one's just an example of a piece of concrete that has the helix in it. And I'm going to show you some other interesting applications that have been used. This precaster has really per, uh, perfected the method of, uh, of uh, sort of uh, casting you know even very complex geometries without the the the, the product coming to the surface. So there's a little bit of proprietariness in this, but this kind of shows that tongue and groove connection system. It doesn't really show how the rail engages it, 
but uh, the rail does engage it. There is a screw that secures everything together, but the screw is not the primary load carrying capability. The design condition was 300 miles per hour. The, the, it was a high strength mortar, and you can see from the mix, low water cement ratio, it had a lot of additive in it so that the slump is in that 10 inch range. You know, they pour these into forms, which I'll show you in a second, and they're able to come up with all these different shapes. 13,000 PSI compressive strength, 150 pounds per yard of the twisted steel micro rebar, which is right around 1% by volume. So I'm just going to kind of go through a couple of pictures here. Uh, this is sort of a, as the building goes through. I'll go back here. You can see the railing system a little bit here, if I can use this uh, uh, up here. These are the rails that are, that are anchored into the concrete. And I'll actually mention also that this is an ICF building. So this is actually foam back here. So these anchors go all the way through the foam into the concrete. And I'll also mention there was a question earlier about the gap between the cladding. There is a significant, there's a fairly significant gap, almost an inch between the building and the, the cladding. So you can see you can, you know, this really does, from an architectural perspective, we have the sort of more textured pieces at the bottom, smooth pieces towards the top, um, and we're even able to achieve these very complex sort of geometries. All, everything that you see here is, is, is reinforced with the product. So uh, you can see that there's a gargoyle structure there. There's a, there's a lion head there. And there are different symbols and things that are casted into the side of the building. These things are put, they're locked into the rail system. And what you'll see is there's little spacers there. Uh, there's actually a grout that's applied in between the cladding after everything's secured. Here's just more uh, pictures. That's the lion's head. Uh, the casting, uh, which I'll show in a minute, you know, is, is pretty interesting how they do it with the plastic. Uh, they, can, they can do just about any geometry with it. Again, one of the owner's concerns was blast resistance. There was some more testing beyond this that was done on the actual cladding. And what it showed is that the cladding sort of acted as a, it, more or less a sacrificial layer. They, they tested up to a 30 pound uh, charge set right on top of the, the cladding and they were able to show that that cladding actually protected the underlying layer. This shows a piece that didn't have any cladding on it and how the product, even at 30 kilograms, reduces the spalling that you see in the concrete. If we look at actual testing in the mix used for the cladding, you know, again, uh, we haven't done, you know, the, the 1609 type testing, so we don't have the full curves, but um, you can see the increase in compressive strength with uh, the Helix, almost 1,000 PSI. And then modulus of rupture, so that was just a six by six beam test. Um, we're nearly doubling the modulus of rupture of the concrete in a six by six beam test. So you're, in reality, you're getting cracking and you're getting post crack response. You're getting strain hardening or deflection hardening rather. And you can see the, the picture there, you can see you get a nice multiple crack behavior, even under just using a basic load control machine. So that's not a machine that's backing off the load or changing anything, it's just increasing the load and you get this nice multiple crack behavior. Same with the splitting tensile samples. So we get a, a very significant increase in behavior. The product, as I said, you know, it's about a 10 inch slump. It is uh, poured into molds that look like this. It's a, it's a polymer mold. They have a whole setup there where they can cast just about any shape. This is a bird, if you look carefully. And they pour the specimens in just using, or specimens, the, the cladding, just using a nor normal mixer, you know, no special mixing equipment. And then it goes into a, a humidity controlled curing area. These are just, you know, the typical flat, smooth cladding panels that you see there. They're cured for, you know, your, just your typical 28 days and then um, they're either stored or they're, they're installed at that point. And, you know, this is just a little bit more just kind of from an interesting architectural perspective, they're able to do all these sorts of panels. And the advantage of having helix or having uh, the twisted steel micro rebar in all this is it made all of this more, uh, as, as the owner said, uh, one of the key issues with these cladding systems is the clips and the, the attachment to the building. And Mahmoud was talking about that uh, as well. With a UHPC solution like this, you're gonna, always gonna have post crack resistance, you're gonna have hardening, so even if, uh, you know, this gets subjected to, you know, some kind of load, point load at the corners or the attachment points. Even if it cracks, you're still going to, th these pieces aren't going to fall off the building. 
And this is my favorite one, it's the gargoyle. And it's, it's just remarkable that they can get 150 pounds per cubic yard of the, this product into this, into this uh, type of geometry. But these things are kind of all over the uh, outer edges of the building. So the status of the project is it's, it's, it's probably about 25% cladded at this point. Um, we're looking at other applications and perhaps taking this idea you know, to the broader market. At this point, it's just this uh, particular uh, building. And uh, you know, these are some of the references. And um, you know, I'd be glad to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very yep. much. Yes. Yeah, I mean, the, the product's compliant with ASTM A820, but the behavior because of that untwisting failure mechanism is, is quite a bit different post-crack than a traditional steel fiber. So um, we've gone and sort of uh, the twisted steel micro reinforcement is sort of a, a, a different category, a new category, but this product does fall under all the same ACI 544 definitions and all that. The behavior is just different. Yeah. Does that, I'm sorry? The cladding? Uh, no, no, it's just, it's, they're just facade panels and again, the only, the, the purpose they would serve is impact resistance in the event something hit the building. Um, the owner wanted to make sure that the connection was good enough so that it, say a tree and a tornado hits the building, that uh, it would provide some protection to the underlying concrete. Now he doesn't have much to worry about, he's got 12 inches of concrete with helix and two layers of rebar, but you know. I like the way those cladings are attached to the house or the building here. Um, it seems to be kind of possible to have this modular, so in case a tree hits and then some panels get as far damaged that it would not be nice to look at anymore and you want to replace it, would this be easily be done? No, it, it's easily done. I mean, uh, the connection detail, the picture isn't great, great, but it's a matter of just slipping the cladding out of the railing that secures it. It's almost like uh, if you've done laminate flooring. It, well, it's not la laminate flooring, you can't get out. But uh, with this, you can slip it out of the, the, the deck system if you need to repair it. Yes? Okay, I'm looking at your material here yes? for twisting. Uh, I know the purpose of twisting should be increased bond strength, right? Yes, yes. Okay. It increases the bond strength and it gives you right. that untwisting yeah. failure That's mechanism. Right. And reinforced concrete, uh, we have a, a, a relative rib area. That is a, a rib height versus to distance between rib. Mm -hmm. Do you have that kind of parameter of how to measure the bond strength here? Uh, so you're asking, I just want to make sure you're <laughs> I mean that uh, normally for that uh, the important steel, we have uh, that uh, parameter to measure the bond strength. Yes. There is a relative rib area. So I mean that uh, you can have a, a better uh, rib area when we twist the more. Yeah. So uh, the bond strength, I guess, theoretically is governed by the, the well, traditionally is governed by the area surface area in contact. No, no, no. Yeah, I'm, I'm, friction is, is governing, but the twist, it, it's different. I mean, I mean, I mean, that, I mean uh, for conventional reinforcing bar, we don't care about that, uh, but, uh, I mean, the friction or yeah. not much, but, so, but bearing area mostly. Bearing area. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, there have been a number of theoretical models that have been, have been established. Yeah. When I was at the University of Michigan, there was a theoretical okay. model, I think, I probably was involved with some, some further development in that. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a combination of, you know, how the load is transferred into the, 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 twist, the twists and into the, mm -hmm. into, the, into the product. So I could follow up with you afterwards and refer you to a few papers okay. that okay, have kind of studied that topic. Probably micro 
the criticism might be different from that uh, conventional yeah. rate forcing part. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming out. Thank you.